Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Mathematical Consciousness Science online seminar series held in 2020. This seminar series aims to explore the role of mathematics in the scientific study of consciousness and hopes to connect researchers who have an interest in this topic. While every session of the seminar consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. For further information, please visit our website, seminar.math-consciousness.org. Thank you for introduction and also invitation, um, Sean and Johannes and also um, Joanna and others. Uh, I'm very excited to give a talk about uh, this uh, topic, uh, search for an isomorphism between conscious experience and the structure of information. Right. And by the way, I uploaded my talk uh, on OSF, uh, which uh, where, where the uh, website link is visible on the bottom left. But if you also go to my Twitter, uh, I think I um, tweeted the uh, website as well. So if you are interested in these slides, or you know, you don't need to take notes during my um, talk. Before I forget, I wanted to first uh, start with uh, my acknowledgement to my lab members, as well as the uh, key people who I'm, whose work I'm going to refer to uh, in the future. And uh, I also want to thank all the funders, ARC Discovery and also NHMRC, which, uh, both of which are Australian funders, and also Templeton World Charity Foundation in some of the works. Okay, so the background of my talk, uh, I just wanted to start with uh, traditional approaches or currently dominant approaches to neuronal uh, or physical basis of consciousness is um, roughly uh, categorized as uh, follows. One is the neural correlates of consciousness uh, or the approach called NCC, initially uh, advocated by Francis Crick and uh, Christoph Koch, who was my super, uh, supervisor when I was a PhD. Uh, they uh, tried to be more or less agnostic about the theory, but try to focus on the correlates of consciousness. And uh, uh, unlike this type of uh, experimental approach, their approach uh, that is uh, based on the findings in neuroimaging or psychology or cognitive experiments to try to explain various uh, fi uh, findings and the facts about uh, uh, consciousness and uh, functions. The most prominent one would be the global neural workspace theory by Stan Dehane and others. And the other uh, neural-based uh, 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 proposal would include uh, recurrent processing theory by Lame and the others, uh, also innumerable number of uh, other theories exist. And the uh, other quite a distinct type of approach is uh, from phenomenology to mathematical structure type approach. The most prominent or arguably only one and only uh, approach is called integrated information theory by uh, Giulio Tononi. And today I wanted to uh, uh, propose an alternative approach to this uh, neural basis of consciousness, and the, which is actually highly compatible with uh, uh, Tononi's approach, is uh, that the search for an isomorphism between the phenomenal structure and the informational structure. And here, we want to uh, uh, proceed as follows. One is that to characterize structure phenomenology, and then second is to uh, characterize a structure of information, and then finally to characterize a relationship between the two types of the structures. The notable difference from IAT is that um, IAT tries to uh, start from the identity between the structure of phenomenology to structure of information that they are proposing, but rather than being sort of the starting from identity, I uh, want to pose it as a the, the relationship to be something that, uh, that will be established through empirical research and the gradual sort of the refinement of the theories. So the first part is about the structure of consciousness. How can we uh, deal with it? Uh, as you, uh, many of you might agree that any moment of conscious experience, or I interchangeably use it as a qualia or um, contents of consciousness, uh, anything that you are experiencing directly is structured in some way. And for example, seeing face of Mona Lisa, uh, face perception or face qualia is usually 
uh, people uh, consider it as a sort of a spatially organized, uh, you know, eyes are located uh, in a horizontal manner, and then below it, uh, there will be something like on the nose, on the mouth, and they are uh, the characteristic sort of the experience about, you know, seeing face. Another types of the uh, qualia, such as color, has uh, different types of the structure. For example, seeing a, a point of the red uh, on the left side already uh, implies or immediately um, associates a close relationship or similar color perception with yellow or purple and very different from the green. And this type of um, uh, counter uh, factual uh, structure or relationship between the color and unexperienced color is also a uh, characteristic property of the colors. And the other types of aquaria, such as sound, uh, if you um, look at the literature in the tone sound structure, they are uh, proposed as having a uh, spiral-like structure, meaning that the uh, sound of the C is different, uh, but similar to D, and more different from E, and so on. But once you go across one octave, and then to hear the, another a sound of the C, it feels similar. And this kind of a structure is most um, economically ex uh, represented as a helical structure. And uh, uh, both, you know, color and sound, you know, uh, physically speaking, they are both one-dimensional uh, wavelengths, but they are experienced in a different way. And I think this type of the structure is uh, uh, potentially characterizing the distinctness of each qualia. And that's just a hypothesis here. So the conjecture or hypothesis that I want to uh, propose today is that uh, uh, to characterize a uh, type of qualia, it's possible to use a similarity or dis dissimilarity judgment about objects A and B, or qualia A and B. And then uh, when we actually experience A and B consciously, not unlike uh, unconscious perception, then we are always uh, able to make a consistent and meaningful similarity judgment. So uh, just as an sort of empirical test case, uh, I want to uh, spend the next 10 minutes or so to uh, uh, showcase what we can do in terms of the uh, phenomenological research, in terms of the structure of phenomenology or appearance of objects. And uh, for that, I use um, uh, attention, visual attention, as a sort of a tool to manipulate the appearance of the objects. And here, uh, there are three different kind of uh, sub parts of the talk. One is that, uh, uh, by the way, this part is going to be highly uh, psychological or uh, psychophysical. So um, if, you're, if your background is mathematical or philosophy, then it may be uh, difficult, but just let me know um, the question uh, afterwards. Anyway, so the first part is going to briefly review uh, what uh, we know about the discrimination performance or function, what we can do with or without attention to the objects. And then the second part is about uh, recent our papers, looking at how our conscious experience in particular visibility of objects changes with or without attention. And then the third one is our latest research, not yet published, um, to characterize uh, the structure of um, object perception with or without attention. So the first part. So throughout all this talk, um, I'll use this dual task paradigm. And here the dual task paradigm is consisted of uh, three conditions of the experiments. And one is a um, single central task condition. And here, subjects are performing only at the central task, which is demanding and uh, presumably exhausts all the attentional resource at the center. And then the second condition is the single peripheral condition, where people are trying to do the task at the periphery as best as possible without moving eyes. And in fact, stimulus is short, so short that the moving eyes is counterproductive. And then uh, in both of these cases, single central and single peripheral tasks, we uh, manipulate the stimulus characteristic so that uh, both of the tasks are as difficult as uh, 
um, like uh, seventy percent accuracy uh, correct. So each of the tasks is on its own very difficult uh, using this uh, stimulus manipulation. And then finally, with that calibrated difficulty, we let them let these two tasks compete together, and that's called a dual task condition. And then the idea is if the two tasks, especially the first task, are still, uh, consumes most of the attention, then the second task cannot be performed. But if the second task is, uh, does not consume attention, then uh, we should be able to do two tasks at the same time without any cost. And uh, I'm not sure whether this is going to work on uh, Zoom, but uh, I'm trying to show this uh, demo demonstration of the dual task. Can anybody say, if you can say, uh, see this image or not, movie? Johannes or Sean, uh, can you see? Okay, good. So here I'm showing the central task that is very difficult. Um, it's either five letters of T's or L's, or four T's and one L, or four L's and one T. And this discrimination is very um, difficult, but right now it's slow, so it may be easy. And at the same time, periphery, I'm uh, showing some uh, uh, images, and your task is to say whether it contained the natural uh, animals or not. So for example, in this case, uh, it was all the same letters and no animals, and here it was, uh, there was animals, and there was uh, animals, and there was none, and so on. And then it turns out that uh, if you do this kind of a task one by one, comparing the discrimination performance, this uh, animal versus non-animal uh, discrimination is uh, turns out to be possible to do without uh, consuming much of the attention. Meaning that under the dual task condition, uh, people can do as as good as uh, in the single task condition. This one. On the other hand, uh, the uh, TL uh, discrimination that we presented at the center, even if the T and the Ls are enlarged and only one letter is presented at the periphery, it's not possible to do at the same time. So all the five objects discrimination in this table are the ones that cannot be done compatibly with the central task. And you might notice that at the top of the tasks are something that looks very simple on the top left. For example, blue versus green, uh, the green versus uh, red, or a vertical versus horizontal, or upright T versus Ls. But also notice that the natural scene perception here, uh, like you know, um, including animal or not, or gender of male versus female, which is not that computationally uh, trivial is also possible to do without attention. And one particular theory of uh, uh, explaining this type of the um, example might be that the, uh, the difference between top and bottom is corresponding to uh, the presence or absence of the particular um, detector of the type um, in the visual cortex or not. And if there is face detector, for example, maybe it's not possible, uh, it, it doesn't require attention, but if uh, you want to discriminate the upright uh, cube from the inverted cube, you don't have any you know, uh, special detector, so you need uh, attention. That's one uh, possible interpretation. So most of the dual task experiment in psychophysics didn't really care about consciousness up until uh, a couple of years ago. Um, recently, we added uh, a twist to this task and then now asked people whether they actually see consciously these faces or red green disc like this. And then it turns out that uh, uh, using a confidence rating or visibility rating, uh, it didn't uh, matter, but people actually can uh, see the uh, face versus uh, male versus female consciously. Uh, without attention. However, this red green disc uh, just don't, uh, cannot be seen when you are paying attention at the center. So this is the work by Julian Matthews and uh, one of the most striking uh, aspects of that uh, paper uh, I really liked was that when we paint the face, half red, half green, and uh, the face itself could be either male or female, and then 
if we ask the subjects what the phenomenology of this stimulus was like, then most of them said that, oh, I was able to see the face and the face gender, but the color relationship of red and green, I feel like I saw something, but I just cannot tell. So the phenomenology of particular things, of uh, sort of the uh, one uh, we, which occupy one particular uh, location can be specifically impaired by uh, withdrawing attention, but not the other. Okay, so that was uh, uh, a short story of our uh, recent uh, previous paper. And then now uh, the core of our talk today, which is uh, to get to the sort of structure of experience. So here we focused on uh, uh, partially replicating previous uh, experiments by ourselves, face genders, and also uh, red and uh, green discs, and also rotated and upright, uh, upright T and L uh, stimuli. So this was conducted by my PhD student, Elise Rowe, and she conducted three experiments. And in each of the experiments, we presented two stimulus at the periphery. And then subjects were trained to uh, perform the central task, TL uh, discrimination, which dis uh, demands a lot of attention. And then upon seeing briefly these two targets in the periphery, they were asked to uh, make a judgment about similarity from highly similar to highly dissimilar uh, using a single mouse grid. And then in experiment one, it was two letters, big letters L and T, and two disks of different orientation. And experiment three, it was uh, faces, uh, eight females and eight males. So uh, during the single task situation, um, no, uh, remember that we actually uh, titrated the uh, stimulus duration so brief that uh, it's not that easy to see uh, each of the stimuli, but still people can uh, uh, make a really reliable judgment about uh, uh, similarity. And uh, one thing that was interesting for the uh, LT task was that people started to uh, be able to say similar or dissimilar based on the letter identity, but they really don't differentiate in terms of the orientation. We don't know why, but that's sort of the result here. Uh, by the way, x-axis on this matrix, top left matrix is uh, half L's, and then from half uh, it is T's, and L's and then T's. And the red means uh, dissimilar, and blue means uh, similar. And then in terms of the rotated disks, uh, according to the rotation angle of 45 degrees, people started to say, oh, highly similar to maybe similar to highly dissimilar, as um, you, you know, expect. And then in terms of faces, uh, although we didn't include any uh, identical pairs, uh, people um, spontaneously uh, categorize uh, female to female as similar and female to male dissimilar and so on. So this was all when Subjects were looking at the center, but paying attention to the periphery. And then now, uh, uh, when we reduce this you know, data into the multidimensional scaling, it's clear that you know, people's structure of uh, perception by L's and T's are highly separate, and uh, disks are arranged in a rotated manner, and then uh, female and uh, males are separated like this. And then under the uh, dual task, which is a critical condition, uh, later, uh, this similarity, similarity matrix uh, collapsed quite a bit, as uh, well as a, a disk uh, similarity uh, matrix. On the other hand, uh, face uh, matrix were more or less retained. And in, uh, when we use the multidimensional scaling, the letters were uh, messed up and it started to merge. And then uh, the disks are completely you know, random uh, now but the uh, faces are retained uh, as separate. So this is a uh, sort of the perturbation by attention to see how the phenomenology of the objects uh, based on the similarity can be revealed. Okay. So um, that's the uh, part one summary. Uh, we use attention uh, to, uh, as a way to perturb the phenomenology and then found that the uh, letters and also disks uh, phenomenology gets disrupted. And uh, uh, however, the faces can remain intact. And then uh, using this uh, is uh, potential, this 
paradigms is a potential tool to investigate isomorphism, which I'm going to talk about towards the end. So I should uh, continue uh, going, right, rather than taking questions here. Okay. All right. So now uh, part two. So uh, from this point, it's a little bit mathematical or uh, a theoretical kind of uh, uh, approach uh, using a neural recording. So the question here is uh, what kind of information structures can support the distinct structure of Gloria? That's a question. So uh, all these Gloria, as we know, um, should be st uh, structured and uh, uh, supported by the brain. And the brain is uh, known to be structured to form a hierarchy of uh, causal inter interactions. And uh, as I alluded to uh, in the beginning, NCC type approach uh, implicitly or uh, explicitly assumes that uh, some type of a structure of the brain and its activity state is correlated with the structure of consciousness. However, uh, uh, only subset of the uh, uh, theories explicitly states that the brain itself uh, is not a good uh, candidate for the correlate of the structure of consciousness. And the reason is that there are lots of structures in the brain that uh, whose activity doesn't really matter, even if when we lesion or you know activate or uh, remove even from the brain, and that doesn't uh, change the phenomenology of our consciousness. So uh, the, uh, based on this type of the non-conscious processing uh, uh, experiment, some subset of the theory suggests that, okay, so we need to filter out some type of non-conscious processing from the brain activity and the structure. And then once we uh, filter to uh, obtain the structure of information, and then that can be uh, correlated with the structure of consciousness. And that's what I uh, believe is sort of the, starting point of my investigation. And uh, uh, one of the most promising candidate theories of how to derive information structure is arguably, I would say, uh, integrated information theory by Tononi. And uh, integrated information theory, uh, I'll briefly explain uh, in the next uh, five, 10 minutes, it starts with identifying essential features of any moment of conscious experience. And uh, IAT paper uh, calls it as a phenomenological axioms, which is a set of um, uh, five axioms or uh, fundamental properties of conscious experience, um, consisted of existence, information, and integration, composition, and exclusion. And I, I will not go into much detail for that in this talk. And then uh, the theory goes on to propose what kind of physical substrates can uh, support these properties. And uh, uh, Oizumi's papers uh, most clearly uh, 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 explain this type of approach, but the Maynard's uh, plus, uh, computation papers uh, uh, gives a detailed uh, algorithmic understanding of how it works in reality. And recently we recorded um, uh, YouTube tutorial uh, in our lab, and then now made available. So uh, if you're interested, then um, going through Mainer's uh, supporting material together with our uh, YouTube would probably make your uh, understanding of the IAT um, quite a deep. And uh, why I say that is that uh, when I talk to many people who are uh, who complain or who are not really happy with the IAT. Typically, people don't really understand the IAT and just criticize. And the most extreme thing would be like, IAT proposes a single value of uh, phi, and phi, you know, uh, as a number, cannot be equated with the consciousness. And none of the IAT says that. It is more to do with the structure of this information that uh, they care about. And I don't really understand why this kind of uh, misunderstanding is coming from, but probably it's something to do with the approximation of the file, which was very successful. Okay. So uh, what our lab is actually interested in um, uh, developing the tools to make a precise approximation for these original measures, as well as the uh, empirical testing of the theories through the uh, 
application of the IAT to the neural data. So uh, the data we are focusing on is uh, recorded by my previous uh, student, uh, Gerald Cohen, when he was working in uh, Bruno Pons Swindern's lab in uh, Queensland in Australia. So he uh, held a fly, uh, Drosophila, which is very, very small, uh, like one millimeter or something like that. And then um, to uh, hold, held it through this uh, kind of stick, and then glued it, and then uh, put the uh, ice floor and anesthesia from the side, and then uh, made sure that the flies are uh, responsible or not, responsible or not, through the air path on the other side. And uh, importantly, uh, in the fly brain, uh, uh, many of the neural structures are linearly um, arranged. So one uh, uh, laminar electrode, so called, uh, when penetrating through the uh, fly's eye at the bottom in this way, it can sample the neural activity at the high resolution, high quality, uh, quite you know uniformly across the brain. And as you see, this is the uh, almost unfiltered real data here. And uh, uh, so, starting from this uh, fly uh, brain data, my another PhD student, uh, Angus Leung. Uh, took the application of the IIT into the real. So what we did is uh, first to uh, discretize the signal uh, from two channels. I, by the way, I'm gonna focus on the two channel recording for uh, the next 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. So let's imagine that the channel A is coming from the central brain and the channel B is coming from the mid brain or something like that. And then across time samples, uh, neural activity goes up and down, up and down. And so it's the case for channel A and B. And then we use the median voltage and then uh, to regard above median as an on state and then below to be off state, just to simply you know, discretize, uh, which is uh, required for the current IAT formulation, uh, specifically IAT3 formulation. And then this discretize, uh, time series of channel A and B uh, gives us this um, transition probability matrix to characterize how the system uh, transits from one state to the other. So the way you read this uh, TPM matrix is this, uh, the color encodes the probability and the top left entity corresponds to when the system, uh, this two channel system was uh, zero, zero, meaning below median for both of the uh, channel then uh, one time step after, in our case, it's uh, four or six milliseconds after, probability of A to become on is 0.43, you know, slightly below than 0 0.5. And uh, uh, for the probability of B to go to uh, one is, uh, on is uh, also uh, lower than 0 0.5 and so on, okay? So using this matrix, uh, which is a five uh, eight dimensional uh, uh, property of this matrix, we can unfold how the system's mechanism is constraining other systems mechanism in a specific way and in an irreducible way. And that's how the IAT operates. So the first step is to look at one particular mechanism such as A and then ask the question, how much does the state of the A, which is currently zero, uh, constrain the future state of the potential purview, which uh, means the scope of the influence, because now we are thinking about only the system A, B. We think about, let's start with uh, uh, system A, B, and the purview A, B as a sort of a potential uh, influence that A can make. And then uh, based on this uh, transition probability matrix, we can retrieve this type of the probability distribution. And uh, zero, zero specifies A to be uh, more likely to uh, zero. And that is already showing up with you know, two slightly higher two bars than the 0 0.25, which is a uniform distribution for A, B's um, one step future here. Okay, I hope it's clear. And then uh, the next thing that IAT uh, proposed to do is to look at all the potential effects of the disconnection of the, each of the purview. So here uh, to quantify 
irreducibility of mechanism A's influence on the power view AB, we can cut the influence between A to A or A to B or A to A and A to B. And that's the only you know, possibility that you can remove the influence of the uh, mechanism A onto AB into the future. And then recompute these uh, probability distribution. And that's actually possible to do based on this TPM. And then once you do that, you find out that, OK, A to B doesn't re uh, result in much difference in terms of probability distribution. So this is uh, called uh, in IIT terminology uh, uh, minimum information partition or something that approximates this probability distribution. And this is, uh, no matter what you do, it is irreducible. Uh, in terms of the influence of A onto AB. And therefore, we take this at 0 0.191 as the potential irreducibility of A onto the other entity in the system. Next, uh, we do the same um, procedure, not only A to AB, but A to A or A to B. You know, basically look at all possible par views cases. And it turns out that A to A, um, connection in this case is a very, very um, deterministic or sort of that uh, uh, constraints A the future really strongly. So when, when we disconnect A to A, then uh, the probability distribution of uh, A and B completely changes. That means that uh, A's influence on uh, A, part A, is most significant. And then according to exclusion uh, uh, principle in IIT, it is uh, this A to A uh, chosen as a uh, the, so characterize, uh, characterizing a re uh, irreducibility of mechanism A into the future within this system. And this is sometimes called also integrated information uh, or small phi. And then if you repeat this for all subsets of the system, uh, A, not only A, but also B and also AB, and then also look at not only the future but also to the past, you can compute how much irreducible, irreducible influence as a sort of a set of the system for this uh, candidate system A B, and then it turns out in this case A's uh, uh, influence is most you know most strong from A and then to A, and the B's influence is most strong from B and then to B, and then A B is most uh, strongly influenced from both AB and then influencing to AB. And then as an irreducibility, uh, we need to take the minimum. So that's uh, the bolded numbers are the ones that uh, they take as a sort of that um, a constituent of integrated information. And then now um, as a final step, IIT proposes to repeat this by cutting one of the connections within this system and then try to see how much of the system is uh, altered. And then it also tries to do all sorts of the different kind of cuts. And then in this particular case, it turned out that unidirectional cut from B to A cut doesn't do much onto this you know, system. And that's the candidate to uh, uh, quantify how much irreducibility this system has. So just to uh, uh, go through this, Cutting the inference from B to A doesn't make any difference for A and also B, but AB system gets influenced a little bit because B to A doesn't now constrain it from past to the uh, current and the current to the future also B to A connection doesn't do anything. And therefore uh, it has a slight difference. And then in the end, the original system and also our cut systems uh, this probability distribution is compared. In this case, A and B are identical, so th there is no contribution from the left side. But the uh, A, B things are slightly different, especially in the future, if you can see here. And then uh, that's the uh, more famous uh, value called the big phi. Uh, IIT proposes that so the correlates of the level of consciousness to be determined as this uh, weighted average between the small phi and the probability distribution, 0 0.000654. And in the uh, preprint paper, we propose that rather than having this, 
uh, elaborate uh, big phi uh, method, why don't we just count the number of um, these small phi as a constellation or systems as a uh, measure of the integrated information or level of consciousness uh, for several reasons. And then uh, the out outcome of this uh, computation, uh, we can do uh, relatively easily for up to four channels is as follows. So here we are visualizing the result of this uh, phi analysis in um, this uh, uh, three dimensional way. And uh, starting from the uh, left side of the uh, figure, I'm showing that on the x-axis uh, is a mechanism size starting from A or AB or ABC or ABCD. And then each of the color or the color the dot corresponds to different uh, channels, A or B or C or D. And then connection uh, corresponds to uh, the identity of this thing. So A and B connects to AB. And then ABC is connected to A and also B and C and so on. And this is one particular flies, uh, particular four channel sets example, but it is a representative nonetheless. Wake uh, flies uh, recording tend to have a very complicated and also magnitude uh, structure, whereas anesthesia uh, reduces the structure quite a bit and the uniformly across all the orders. And this uh, is uh, using uh, decoding analysis, classification analysis to characterize how much we uh, uh, lose by anesthesia uh, using across fly classification. So here we you, uh, look at uh, integrated information measure from uh, 12 flies and then set the threshold and then look at the 13th flies uh, wake or anesthesia uh, decision. And then we found that you know our uh, aggregated sort of structure measure slightly performs better than um, big fly. But an important thing is that uh, each of the uh, structures like A, B, C, or A, B, or A, B, C, A, B, C, D doesn't really uh, perform as well as uh, uh, big fire or uh, structures. So uh, to summarize, uh, in part two, in a sense, I wanted to show the demonstration or feasibility of uh, computing or characterizing structure of information in neural systems. And uh, this is possible to do with the observation of the system dynamics. And um, we have done something similar using a previous version by IIT, and we are now doing uh, the same thing with uh, different, uh, and, uh, the newer version by IIT, but now focusing on qualia rather than the level of consciousness. And uh, according to IIT, richness of the structure of information or so the volume of this uh, shape um, should correspond to a um, uh, uh, level of consciousness, and uh, it seems it's more or less supported so far. And um, uh, one thing I just briefly want to mention is that the IAT is not the only option to investigate the structure of information. And uh, briefly, I'll talk about epsilon machine approach or computational mechanics. So here's a collaboration with my uh, colleagues in Monash, uh, uh, Kaban Modi and his student, uh, 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 Robert Munoz and also uh, Felix uh, Pollock. Uh, Pollock. And um, you basically, we use the same data, fly uh, LFP recordings, and then digitize, uh, discretize the data, and then try to derive the minimum, uh, minimally uh, complex structure that can reproduce these uh, observed dynamics from uh, just based on a single channel in this case. And then we got, for example, uh, based on the same uh, channel, uh, reconstruct the most you know, simple uh, structure model or hidden Markov model, um, like the right side or left side. Maybe I, I should have uh, prepared the poll, but who thinks that the right side simplistic one is uh, uh, the model from the awake flies or anesthetized flies? And then the other side, the left side is um, awake flies or anesthetized flies. So maybe uh, you might already know about the answer, uh, but the right side is coming from actually anesthetized fly brain and the uh, left side is a wake uh, brain. So the complexity according to this epsilon machine, minimum uh, complex uh, uh, method is also possible to distinguish this in a level of consciousness. And also interestingly, I think, Unlike other types of the complex uh, uh, measure, epsilon machine can have also structure 
which is uh, possible to compare with the IIT's prediction in terms of the you know, prediction on the qualia. How well I'm doing in terms of time, Johannes? Okay. Okay, because my clock says something weird, so. Well, anyway. And, um, in the last, yeah, that's fine. And then in the last 10 minutes, I'll just then briefly talk about uh, how to then uh, um, study this uh, relationship or you know, network or structure, whatever I show, I said. So this is the first slide I, I used for this you know, uh, talk. And this is uh, now I explain what it means. The left side is about sort of the external stimuli and then top right, uh, top right is sort of the conscious experience. And then we try to characterize its structure through some kind of similarity rating. That's experiment one. And the bottom side is uh, uh, recording from the brain and then deriving the information structure. And then the, uh, my goal is to find some kind of isomorphic correspondence between uh, structure to structure. So translated into actual experimental finding, uh, here is uh, you know in the version of the you know experiment. Uh, so we show uh, with or without attention, you know, two types of faces, and then uh, based on the similarity, we predict that the uh, quality of the uh, female and the males should be separated inside the brain. And accordingly, if you uh, record from the brain uh, regions and the appropriate area, and then reconstruct the qualia related uh, structure, then we should be able to find the shape. And then using some kind of the measure of the similarity or distance between the shape, we should be able to find something similar to this. If the theory such as IAT or if the machine is correct, and this is totally doable type of the uh, research project, I, I think, uh, but, but nobody has done that. Uh, so that's the thing that I want to do in the next couple of years. And uh, as a sort of the framework for studying this type of the relationship or structure, I'm uh, most interested in the category theory. And this is something that uh, I want to talk with some subset of the participants today afterwards. And as you might know, uh, category theory has been uh, utilized in uh, bridging across many different fields. But especially, uh, I've been uh, um, proposing that maybe phenomenology and the information structure can be bridged by this. So uh, just briefly, uh, uh, going through the, uh, the basis of the category theory. And uh, there are lots of excellent textbooks, so I will not go into the further. Um, category is uh, consisted of, is a system consisted of the objects and arrows, and then for our purpose, uh, we can uh, think about the quality of different kinds, let's say color or sound or face or whatever, as an object, and then arrow as a similarity. And then you know, for the similar object, there, there is uh, arrows, but for the dissimilar object, there is no arrow, something like that is fine to consider. And then the second important uh, component is this uh, uh, thing called a uh, functor that is uh, related, that's possible to relate between these two types of the category. So our idea is, in a sense, linking between the category of the qualia to category of the information through the functor in both ways. And if we can do that, then that's already great, but that's still far right now. And uh, one, uh, you know, application to make the functor more uh, sort of the familiar to uh, you, uh, if you're not familiar, then we consider uh, three objects, AX and B, uh, X and uh, A, B, C for X and A, B, C for Y. And maybe it could be like an apple, orange, and also, you know, uh, cherry and something like that. And the arrow corresponds to the similarity in terms of color. For X, it seems like uh, all of the three objects are similar. So there are arrows over there. But for the Y, there are no arrows, meaning that you know, this person is so sensitive that you know, the colors for three objects are not the same at all. But interestingly, in category theory, we can have a functor from the category of the quality for X as well as the category of Y in both ways. Uh, but uh, you, you have to construct um, uh, the functor 
in a way that you know it preserves and so respects the structure of this. And uh, it turns out that the cut uh, functor from x to y, uh, x to y, in going this way from top to bottom has a very strong you know restriction because there has to be some kind of arrows but from bottom to top you can do anything because there is no arrows so that uh by that uh so this type of the uh, functor uh categorization uh, characterization can uh depict the richness of the structure between x and y uh in a nice and quantitative way which is probably not that uh, available in the psychology of neuroscience for now. And then the tra natural transformation, which is also important, uh, and also the object uh, or the ultimate object of the category theory is, in a sense, relationship between the two functors, functor F and functor G. And uh, in terms of the consciousness, or Korea example, you can think of uh, natural transformation as a category of uh, you know, objects whose uh, similarity is defined at the fovea, central vision, and then transfer that similarity and object into the periphery on the left side or right side. That's two functors, left functor and right functor. And then natural transformation, if it exists, means that um, this left functor uh, object and the right functor, you know, transfer the object should have a coherent relationship. And that's what it means to have a natural transformation. So I, I think uh, we, I don't want to go into more detail, but the category theory offers many different kind of uh, uh, of uh, sameness, like functor or natural transformation, which is uh, very useful to characterize Korea. And uh, in our recent paper, uh, I particularly focused on this uh, very interesting uh, lemma called the Yoneda's lemma in category theory. In a uh, nutshell. What it says is that if you cannot define or characterize the object X, such as Quoria, you know, uh, Quoria or red is very difficult to describe, you know, no matter how many words you uh, use, it's, it just can't, you know, uh, capture the richness of the red, for example. But in such a situation, Yoneda's lemma says that, okay, if you can characterize what you want to characterize with others in terms of relationship, then if you find another thing that has the same relationship with the original one, it has to be the same. That's the sort of option. So this um, uh, also you know, nicely fits with our similarity or our, our rating type of experiment. Something that you cannot directly capture as an object can be indirectly characterized through the older relationship through the similarity. And this is one example uh, of the uh, explanation of the, this famous illusion um, um, that I featured in our preprint paper. So uh, the part three summary, briefly, is that uh, I, uh, you know, literally, really briefly introduced the category theory and uh, uh, proposed that uh, a category of quadria is not something that is very difficult to construct or conceive. And uh, it's likely to uh, be important uh, to, you know, uh, educate our consciousness research, I think, uh, through this category theory, like thinking of different kind of sameness. And then also I, I propose that um, defining consciousness or Korea through the relationship, like Yoneda's lemma. So the uh, last slide, this is a take form message and the future directions um, in a um, sense. I wanted to, uh, in my future, uh, so the future uh, research to crack the fundamental question of the physical base of consciousness, uh, I propose that we need to characterize the structure of a qualia uh, and also uh, to derive the structure of information from the neural data and then to link or to compare between the conclusion from the both sides. Uh, the phenomenal and the informational domain could be using very simple thing like a uh, correlation, but uh, I think category theory type uh, rich description of the relationship would be more useful in the future. Thank you.